All right, here we are for our Higher Health Immune Health Series. We thought this was a perfect time to share some of our, our health insights and to give some positive support. And really, you know, there's a lot of noise happening right now, and um, it's easy to dive into maybe the to a fearful pool and uh, really there's a lot we can do to support and protect ourselves and we need to keep this in mind as we go about our day and and really no <laughs> stress does not help our immune health so let's bolster some immune resilience today with some mindset and micronutrient talk with two of my favorite colleagues we have dr lindsay walker um give a wave and sandra pribernath registered psychotherapist and myself uh, Dr. Tara Campbell. So let's just start into our conversation today. And this is part one of a three-part immune series. So higher immune health, we're going to be speaking about what that is to each of us in our, pra our respective practices. We're going to talk about astragalus, andrographis, and echinacea, three key botanicals for immune health and what you need to know about them stress and your immune system, how to bolster your resilience through mindset in addition to micronutrients and other health practices, and vitamin C, oral versus intravenous, how much vitamin C to take to help your immune system, acute care versus chronic versus preventative, and how much to take when you feel sick. So our first speaker today is Dr. Lindsay Walker. As I said, naturopathic doctor. Lindsay is really the botanical medicine guru at Higher Health, but not only for Higher Health, for all of our colleagues. So when we want to, when we have a question about a, a botanical, Lindsay is the person we go to. And just, I always say her vernacular, her um, presence when it comes to botanical medicine and naturopathic care is uh, just well sought after and I'm grateful that Dr. Walker is at Higher Health because we all benefit from her expertise. So Lindsay has been practicing for 15 years doing consulting for a Canadian nutraceutical company and she has focused on botanical medicine for 12 years in her practice. Key questions we'll be covering with Dr. Walker are understanding the difference between immunomodulation and immunostimulation, there's a difference there, quality aspects when it comes to the key botanicals will be learning about today, so andrographis, astragalus, and echinacea. So Lindsay, why don't we, um, I'm gonna stop screen share there so that we go into just the three of us. Is that the three of us showing right now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And yeah, let just, let's talk about those three botanicals and what we need to know about them and helps people decide which one may be best for them. Yeah, so I think this is really timely information, obviously, because of what we're currently enduring as a society. Uh, but we're also entering our official cold and flu season shortly. So understanding how to keep your immune system ageless and accurate is like a complete defining moment in prevention of respiratory illnesses across the board. And we get a lot of questions at the clinic about differentiating between uh, immune supporting botanicals, the three that we're going to talk about today, and understanding the finer points of how to use them properly. Um, so one key thing I think to point out is the language we use to describe botanical medicine. Um, so a lot of people ask questions about immunostimulation, like is echinacea immunostimulatory? Is uh, andrographis immunostimulatory? And I would actually prefer the term immune modulating because stimulation implies the fact that you could go to a place of um, no return with it, that you could aggravate from an immune stimulant. Um, and really the botanical medicines that we are very well versed in and have Western medical clinical data to prescribe and recommend, they don't immunostimulate, they immunomodulate. They're immodulating a very orchestrated well-versed response that our body has intrinsically. And so I think it's critical to, to highlight that point, to reduce fear around botanical medicines, because these medicines have been with us for centuries, and they still are effective today against broad spectrum viruses and other things that are chronically trying to take us down. So um, that's important, I think, to just say from the get-go, 
Also, with herbal medicines, anytime you take anything, it should be working for you. You should have a clinical benefit, a, a tangible response to whatever you've taken. And in the retail health sphere, there's just a lot of garbage out there as far as uh, quality botanicals because vitamin C is very different from an herb that's grown, dried, harvested, sent to a manufacturing facility to be tested. Um, so there's a lot of biological history with uh, botanical medicine, medicine specifically. And you really have to know as a consumer, when you buy an herbal product, what plant part is it? Has it been extracted in alcohol? Does it have active constituents in the actual formulation? How long you should take it for? How much you should take? So these are all like very important things as a consumer that you wanna be educated upon when you go to purchase an herbal product of any sort. And I find that those points, those, they definitely affect efficacy and they definitely affect safety. Yet a lot of people don't know about those particular checks and balances, mm -hmm. which is why it's always good to consult with a professional who knows about those checks and balances. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of myths out there. People want to really attack self-care right now. They want to do their, the best they can for themselves and really understanding the spectrum of what's right for you, what's safe and what's efficacious, especially in the botanical world, you can really use some assistance from a professional in that, in that lane. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, all things aren't created e equal in botanical medicine, that's for sure. This is just a, it's a complicated, way more complicated process than uh, generating nutraceuticals, which are different. I love so, that because it, yeah, it's setting up the conversation of comparing botanical medicine and vitamin C and, you know, the concrete vitamins and minerals where botanical medicine, what if it was a bad crop? What if it was, um, yeah. You know, the sun wasn't really shining on that area. So exactly. So yeah, exactly. So you could have like low yield from a crop that gets sent to manufacture. And if they didn't test it, they didn't know the levels of actives that were present. They would just make the product not knowing that it was low potency mm -hmm. raw material. So mm -hmm. that's why there's such like a difference between spectrums of products out there because yeah. of that reason. Yeah. So it's a mm -hmm. herbs or biological entities whether they get enough rain, whether they get enough sun, whether the soil was rich with micronutrients when it was growing, all affects the, the products that are manufactured and how potent and how potent and efficacious they are. And I want to ask Sandra a question here, just as, so Sandra is a registered psychotherapist and she's going to be guiding us through some mindset exercises today, which do really have an impact on our immune health. So I love the combination of of speakers we have here, of colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so Sandra, knowing that we've mentioned three botanicals, uh, yeah. Anthropographus, Astragalus, and Echinacea, what do you think when you hear those three? Like would they, or what would your top immune botanicals be? Did you know about, or, or do they sound foreign to you? They don't sound boring, I wanna learn more. So foreign, like- Please, Lindsay, <laughs> tell more. <laughs> yeah. But like if, if you were to say your top immune nutrients. Echinacea. I love echinacea. Echinacea, yeah. And Lindsay has mm -hmm. so much to share when it comes to echinacea. She's, <laughs> she's made me more aware of its benefits and which, which mm -hmm. versions not or which um, portions, you know what I'm trying to say, which parts of the plant are not actually beneficial. Correct. Um, yeah, well, I guess that's a good segue then, Lindsay. Let's let's just go into those three because sure. would you say there are top three, like naturopathically? Oh, for sure, 100%. Yeah. And like echinacea, like I love educating about the points on these plants because they're easy to understand once you under like mm -hmm. have the right information. Mm -hmm. So echinacea is like a kingpin for prevention. It works very well as a preventative it's not as good at treating something that is already afoot if you haven't already been on it for some time. So a couple of important things with echinacea. There's three species. The two medicinal species are echinacea angustifolia and echinacea purpurea. And those are the two species you always wanna find present in whatever uh, supplement or botanical medicine you're taking. 
They should always be made from the root. The cone flower has very, very low levels of active medicine. So preparations made from the cone flower are quite benign. They don't have that like potency. So very important, the two species be present. It be made from the root that it have, has gone undergone some type of alcohol extraction to get the alkalamide. Those are the constituents in echinacea that give it its medicinal effect that it goes through an alcohol extraction to get those out. And then it can be dried and put in a capsule. It could be evaporated. Um, the alcohol could be evaporated off, it could be pressed into a tablet. It could stay in a fluid extract state. That would be like a tincture. So very important that those three targets are hit. Plant part, root, two species, alcohol extraction. And in the real kind of creme de la creme, uh, echinacea medicines or echinacea products, you'll see the number, a milligram dose of alkalamides right on the product because that shows that it's been uh, processed to contain that active and that it's there in that milligram amount and it leaves people not guessing whether it's there or not. Mm -hmm. So very important and with echinacea, when you use it, it really takes two to three weeks to work. So what's recommended in a preventative model is low dose continuous therapy with echinacea dosing. So you take a small dose each day in the fall and winter, and it doesn't wear out your immune response. That's called tachyphylaxis. There's no evidence to support that that occurs with echinacea, but it does need runway to gather hold of improving um, phagocytosis. So that's what white cells do. They phagocytize, they engulf viruses, bacteria that are trying to make us sick. So it increases that ability, it increases white blood cell count, and it increases white blood cell activity. But it needs two to three weeks to start doing that, which is why it's a really wonderful preventative. Um, and very well tolerated, very few people are allergic to it. Um, and again, not immunostimulatory, immune modulating. So it's modulating the innate immune response the nonspecific immune response, which is this one arm of the immune system that does a lot, a lot of surveillance for us on a daily basis. So when someone comes in to see you with an active cold uh, and they say, oh, I just started taking echinacea, what mm -hmm. is your response? I, I tell them exactly what I've told you girls that, you know, I can understand why they made that selection. Uh, however, there's a better agent that's faster acting because echinacea is really a preventative. So it, again, needs longer runway. It's meant for long-term use. That's where it behaves the best. That's where it really shines. And I will educate them on andrographis. So andrographis is really what I consider, and most people who are quite educated in botanicals, the acute rescue agent. If you're already sick, andrographis, will turn that around. So it has a much faster effect on, again, non-specific immune response. So helping you or your body uh, fight off the virus, reduce symptoms, reduces the intensity of the symptoms, the duration, the frequency of the symptoms, specifically for upper respiratory infections. Um, and with it, we know it's better to give a high dose. So the dose in the clinical trials on andrographis is to give 12 to 18 grams a day uh, for about seven to 10 days to really hit it. And you have to take it several times a day to keep your blood levels nice and uh, effective. And, and it works in that scenario where you're already coming down with something, you have early mild symptoms, uh, and it will do everything I've just said, shorten the duration, shorten the intensity, and shorten the frequency. So it has very good data on, um, you know, for seasonal flu and for common colds. So yeah, rhinitis. And Sandra, have you heard of andrographis before? No. No, see, I'm learning something new. Yeah, andrographis. Is, that's it. Uh, yeah, but a lot of people ask me about oil of oregano, and I would say yes. nobody in our clinic, in our dispensary carries oil of oregano. No. <laughs> it's surprising, right? Um, so, but andrographis will be well-stocked. Yes, yeah. 
It's uh, like I've used it obviously so much over the last 15 years. It's like a staple. Mm -hmm. And patients, when they've taken it, they'll come in and restock it and say, oh, you know, I'm well, but I'm about to go on a flight in a couple of weeks and I want to take it prophylactically to prevent myself from getting sick, knowing because they're well educated, they know they don't have two to three weeks to take echinacea every day. They want to just start something shorter course that will work faster. So it's just really good like to know those different prescribing points so that you get the right medicine for the right duration and whatever you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And have you ever seen echinacea, is it cone flower or corn? corn flower? Cone, the cone flower. Cone, cone flower. yeah. Have you ever seen that on labels? Okay, so yeah, the echin different companies that manu manufacture echinacea will put a picture of the flower on the bottle because it, it grows, like it's indigenous to many continents. Um, but the medicine is actually not made from the cone flower. It's made from the root. However, some German companies make medicine from the cone flower and they do an aqueous extraction, which means a water extraction, and their products are so like, again, not very efficacious because it's the wrong plant part. And it's not the needs the alcohol extract method to get the alkalamides out. So yeah, so there's a couple German-based uh, products that you'll see in the Canadian marketplace that are made from the flower, and they don't work very well therapeutically because mm -hmm. of that. So it's really good to just hammer that home. Make sure you're getting the root, and look for those two um, species. Parts. Maybe actually say. <laughs> Go get your echinacea from your cupboard and let's see. We'll double check your echinacea. <laughs> Actually, you probably have the, the right version. <laughs> um, okay, I'll so come to that. Higher Health to get some. You would? I'll come to Higher Health yes. to get some. <laughs> well, that's why I think you have the right one in your in your <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, so that brings my favorite botanical to the third one to speak about. I just love astragalus. And so, yeah, how do you compare astragalus in with what you've talked about so far, Lindsay? Yeah, so another kind of good DDX point for astragalus. So astragalus is for the chronically immunocompromised. So these are people uh, that get sick five to six times a year. They touch a doorknob, they get sick. They stay up too late, they get a sore throat the next day. They have very poor regulation for immune tone. Whereas like you prescribe echinacea as a preventative to a healthy person that says, no, I only get sick one to two times a year. When I do get sick, it's a self-limiting infection. I get better on my own with rest and fluids. I don't require an antibiotic prescription. Those are the people that fit the echinacea category. The people who fit the astragalus category are exactly like those, yes, like chronically, uh, chronically ill with like if, if there's a virus afoot those people get it so and they'll tell you that if you question them about okay so how is your immune health how many times are you sick a year etc so it's for people that lack vitality and in Chinese medicine where their chi is low so that's where you would use astragalus astragalus comes to us from traditional Chinese medicine practice it has very good data on increasing on neutrophils so a certain type of white blood cell when those are low and neutrophils are very critical for fighting bacterial infections. Um, there's lots of good data with astragalus on helping that particular facet for people who are undergoing chemotherapy for cancer treatment. So it's used alongside um, uh, with oncology patients where we're trying to bolster their white blood cell count because we know it's being annihilated by the chemotherapy. Uh, and great safety profile, again, very safe, should be used at the right dose. Um, and it is a builder. So when people come in and it's early October and we're talking a lot about seasonal infection prevention, I'll ask them a lot of questions and then I'll figure out where they fit. Are they an echinacea person because they're, they're well and we're using it as a preventative? Are they kind of more in the chronically immunocompromised zone where they get sick very frequently? Or can I just leave them alone? <laughs> give them a good dose of vitamin D and take, talk about hygiene and give them astragalus as a bailout agent should they become sick. I love it. So Andrographis is the acute rescue agent. Yes. Astragalus is the builder. Yep. And echinacea, do we have a key buzzword for echinacea? The preventative, like 
The preventative, yeah. I see cartoon characters for each of these. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll have a mascot. Um, so that's amazing info for everyone to know the different, the key differences between andro echinacea and astragalus. And we welcome any further questions on these. There's more to know, but that's like a, a really great intro. And so, and afterwards, so we're going to move into the movement section now, or mind, mindset section now. Mindset. It's mindset and movement. And yeah. then Sandra will has to um, sign off after this portion, and then Dr. Walker and I will continue the conversation. Okay, okay so let's just do a little intro for Sandra. I feel so fortunate to know and work with Sandra. Um, oh my goodness, it's back to this screen share. <laughs> slide share. Okay, I'm not even going to go into it. Sandra Pribernak is a registered psychotherapist, and today, per portion, we are going to be learning about mindset and immune resilience. So questions from Sandra and what we will cover today is being rooted in mind and body for immune support, immune support the integration of nervous, endocrine, and immune systems, which is so important, and metabolizing stress for overall wellness and resilience. So Sandra, I'm excited Wonderful. to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. I love, like I wrote down um, uh, four keywords as both of you were kind of uh, sharing already. Um, so I'll kind of just, just go from there. I think it's so important uh, what you, Tara, mentioned at the beginning. Um, you know, we've been in this, in the pandemic for six months already, and um, there's a lot of fatigue. You know, so it's really important going into the fall. It's the change of season. Um, it can be a little bit um, tricky transition for many people. Plus, we have the six uh, months of the fatigue. So to know really how to support ourselves in the best possible way uh, and how to, uh, what you Linda mentioned, like the, the build up the chi. So like get the energy uh, moving. The other thing that I uh, love, Love that you both talked about and that I will talk about is self-care because I think it, it's never been this uh, important. And then finally, uh, Lindsay mentioned the word, you know, or orchestrating, you know, like kind of bringing together. And uh, there, is a, there is a whole, uh, there is a name for this in what I'm going to talk today. And the name of the network that I will talk today, it, it's a mouthful. Try to say this very fast. Psychoimmunon neuro endocrine network <laughs> so basically what it say, says is that our psychology our nervous system our immune system and our endocrine system are all connected right so it's 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 been known for a very long time um as you know i'm a body centered psychotherapist so i always go back to the body and in any kind of chronic state such as pandemic we've been uh, in in this uh well, like I used already the word fatigue. We've been in it for a long time. So oftentimes for many of us, going out of the body is, a, is just a natural first response uh, way to, to manage and to metabolize what we've been surrounded with because there is, it's, it's a lot. So um, one of the things that I really um, work with my uh, client is how to go back in and what to do to constantly manage the too muchness of what we are facing in so many layers of our lives, be it, you know, self-isolation because of the social distancing, uh, um, just, you know, not knowing when you're going to see your family, if your family lives uh, far away, um, if your kids are going to school, like a lot of the things to manage as well. So like how to kind of go back in, like deeper and wider and uh, really strengthen what we already have. So stress in itself is not uh, a bad guy, like stress itself will not just cause the the problem unless it's on a toxic uh, side of the scale but the way we perceive stress and respond to it can begin to open a door for lowering uh, the immune system does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah it's so great it does. What? Oh, i'm sorry just <laughs> that was my water bottle that's fine okay so um 
the more, uh, the longer we have the stressors present, we talk about something which we call strain, or in the field of trauma, we say strain trauma. So trauma doesn't have to be, you know, big thing happening in your life and something like shocking uh, that really alters you um, like um, instantly. Strain trauma is, you know, like if you have a piece of metal and you bend it and you can put it back and then you can bend it and you can put it back. And after you do this several times with a piece of metal, it can't just go back. So if you are exposed, if I'm exposed to something over and over and over again, and I'm not either fully, I, I might not have the time to look at it, or I'm not fully conscious, or there is simply too much to take care of, and I can't really self care, then this bending will eventually strain me and lower the chi and open the door to whatever thing that can happen. And if you so imagine it chronic over disease, and over again, it can snap, right? Yeah, 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 you could, yeah. So what I wanted to uh, offer today is a short visualization, which um, is kind of twofold. One, to um, really con you know remind us that we are of the same composition of the entire universe so that we are all connected that we are connected to the nature that we are connected to you know plants animals everything and everyone that breathes and is alive today we are kind of this larger network of life so we are embedded in that kind of wider network so that's one thing and the other thing is to add the portion about um, visualization, which can be quite potent because, you know, when we close our eyes and we visualize things, our body on the inside doesn't know that what I'm visualizing, it's not really happening. The body begins to react as if it's really there. So that's why visualizations can be powerful. So I'm going to invite us, I'll have my eyes open, but I'm going to invite uh, Lindsay and Tara to, to try it if they wish and for everybody else who's listening to this to try. So we begin by um, sitting on a chair or on the ground with your back upright. So try not to do this lying down. If you absolutely have to, that's fine. The only reason not to do it lying, lying down is because you might fall asleep. And then to, you know, just feel your feet on the ground or, uh, or if you're sitting cross-legged to feel the support beneath your sit bones and to, you know, allow a couple of breaths and then just to allow your gaze to soften or your eyes to close. If closing your eyes is not an option for today, it's totally fine just to bring your gaze down to the ground so that you are not getting distracted by whatever is going on around you. That's the only reason to have it down. Otherwise, allowing the gaze to... Um, your eyes to gently close. And then just for a couple of moments to kind of gather yourself, to come back to yourself, to notice that you're in this body that's already breathing and that you don't have to do anything to breathe. So just allowing the breath to come and go at whatever rhythm is the most nourishing for you at this moment to allow the events of the day so far to gently fade into the background and whatever else is planned for later today to just gently fade. So to really um, give yourself a gift of self-care and for the next five or so minutes to simply follow um, my voice and the words that I'm saying and allow the pictures or the felt states to unfold inside of you. So we're going to do a visualization on, of, on presence of four elements in the body. So earth, water, air, and fire. So we're going to observe how our composition is the same as the composition of the rest of the universe. And we'll begin with the element of earth. So notice what comes up for you when you feel earth, when I say earth, solid, steady, earth. And feel or imagine 
that solidity, the earth element of your own body. For example, your bones, solid, steady bones. Your spine is a good place to begin. Every vertebrate on top of the next, from the tail all the way to the head and your skull on top of it with little cushions between their vertebrae so they're not getting pinched and how your spine holds you up. So it's not just the chair or outside elements providing the holding, the support, but that there is actually a support inside of you that belongs to you, that it's solid and steady, your spine, the element of earth inside of you. Your shoulders, your shoulder blades, clavicles, the bones in your arms, upper arms, elbows, lower arms, wrists, hands, the pelvic cradle, indeed like a cradle holding all the organs of the lower belly inside, and then the hips, the big bones of the hips, and the big bones of your thighs, knees, lower leg, feet. Connecting inside of your body to all the bones, the big strong bones to the smallest bones. And maybe expand the awareness of the element of earth to the way your hands rest on your knees or the feel of your mouth where the lips meet, the way that gravity binds us to this earth. And then letting this experience gently fade away and coming back to your breath. Just noticing your inhales and exhales. And then moving to the element of water. The blood, the lymph, both part of the immune system. The craniosacral fluid, the fluid around your spine the cord, spinal cord and the vertebrates, and the fluid around the brain and your skull, craniosacral fluid. So blood, lymph, craniosacral fluid, all flowing in their own way, circulating. Every one of those in their own rhythm, like waves rising and falling in their own rhythm the rhythm of your blood circulating through the body, the lymph, the gentle pulse of the craniosacral liquid, the water element. The water element also present in the body as sweat, as tears, as urine, liquid and flowing, remembering we are 80% water. Like waves of the ocean whispering inside of your body. So the earth element in the bones, the water element in all the liquids in the body. And then gently returning back to your breath and letting that experience go. And as you are returning to your breath, coming now to the element of air in the breath itself. The way when we breathe, how the air around us, all of a sudden, as you inhale, it becomes the part of your breath inside of you. And then as we exhale, how our breath becomes air again. Noticing the way that the breath touches the inside of your body. When you inhale, you might feel it in the nose or 
swirling in the back of your mouth, the way it passes through the throat, the way your chest rises and falls with every breath or maybe even all the way to the belly. The movement of the air inside of our body. So we have the earth element in the bones and the water in all the liquids in the body and air in our breath, breathing, moving. And then letting go of that experience and just going back to your breath. And then going to the last element, the fire. Fire is the clicking, the firing of the nervous system. Never stopping, not just in the brain, but all across the body. In every place where nerve cells exist, clicking, firing, sending messages, communicating all the time, cell to cell thought to thought, feeling to feeling, clicking, firing, the fire element. Communication happening inside of your body, cell to cell, without you having to do anything, all the time, never stopping. And now trying to expand your awareness to all four elements happening at the same time. So we have the earth element in the bones of the body. We have water element in all the liquids, blood, lymph, craniosacral, urine, sweat, tears, all the liquids. Air, as you breathe, moving through the body and the fire in our nervous system. And then imagining or seeing a beautiful light blue, sky blue light coming from the heavens and enveloping you in an auric field or a cocoon around your body a protective, safe cocoon. So it's totally okay just to imagine it. You don't have to feel it. Imagining that there could be a beautiful sky blue cocoon enveloping your entire body, physical body, emotional body, cognitive thinking body, energy body. And that this beautiful auric field around you of sky blue color has brilliant lines of light, really strengthening it like little threads, adding additional protection. And that there is nothing and no one that can cross that field without you giving permission. And that it's protective and it's safe. And that all it takes is for you to imagine it there. And that you can do that at any time of the day that you need, that you feel like you need a little bit more support. That it's important to feel your feet firmly planted down at the, on the earth. And that this beautiful sky blue auric field is there for you, around you. Supporting, cleansing, firm lines of light, additionally providing strength.
And then taking all the time that you need to gently let go of this experience, knowing that you can always go back to it and really trusting your body to know when it's okay and safe to open your eyes, when you're fully back. And when you do that, to allow your gaze just to orient you in the room so that you know where you are before coming in eye contact with us on the screen or anybody else around you. Thank you. I always Thank love thinking you. after you because <laughs> you bring me into that strong, <laughs> yeah, presence. Mm. There. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think I can speak for Dr. Walker and myself in terms of the earth, wind, fire, water. And that's part of our mm -hmm. traditional Chinese medicine training, but knowing that all of those aspects are within us and for ourselves with clients, maybe we're, um, we become more dominant in some areas and it's a good reminder yeah. to find that balance of all four within us. So yeah. that's really amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Do you have any comments, Lindsay? Oh, that was sensational. <laughs> Are you in a trance? <laughs> I like, yeah, I just, uh, mm. the uh, connection to the somatic, mm -hmm. the physical self, mm -hmm that I could feel myself like somatizing because I think a lot of us, we really are alive from here up in North America yeah. and we're really disconnected from here down. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was sensational. I really enjoyed it. Thank I'm you. Glad. Awesome. And psycho, psycho neuro endo immunology. Yes. Four times fast um, is really, that is higher immune health. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know you have a client, so we'll say goodbye. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, Sandra. Bye, Sandra. Bye. Bye. And then we'll move into the IV vitamin C portion. And again, I love that Sandra has brought me back into my strong center to speak about something I am so passionate about. And... Um, that I can just speak freely about. So that's what my goal is here today. And I know questions will come up about intravenous vitamin therapy, vitamin C, and the botanicals we've spoken about. And I see Sandra. So is there any way we can keep Sandra here with us? Yeah, sure. Okay. She'll be here. She's <laughs> kind of funny. She's not moving. She's just there. No, but it's great to have her present still with us. Yeah, so vitamins, IV vitamin C, a big question I get all the time are what is the difference between food? Um, supplementation and intravenous and I oh there we go okay so two of us and I really think there's a place there is a place for all three and really the recommended daily intake of vitamin C is 75 to 90 milligrams which is very low and so one orange eating an orange you'll get 200 milligrams of vitamin C in that well sorry in the orange are 200 milligrams we don't actually know how much of that orange of the 200 milligrams you'll absorb through your digestive system, um, but the, the starting orange is 200 milligrams. Um, then supplementation, we normally take 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, or so capsules can be 500 to 1,000 milligrams. And we do know that of that 1,000, only about 200 milligrams is absorbed. So maybe with the orange, that full 200 does, does come into our system. And I always like to also add that a pepper, a green pepper, a red pepper, orange pepper has more vitamin C than an orange at 200 milligrams. Um, so really food wise, it's easy for you to get over 75 to 90 milligrams of vitamin C. And so orally you, or supplement wise, you might take a 500 milligram capsule or a thousand milligram capsule, and that will assure you that you are getting the 200 milligrams into your bloodstream. And if you take 500 at breakfast, then lunch, then dinner, you're getting 200 plus 200 plus 200. And your, your body does, um, it, it's like drinking water as if you just all of a sudden drink more water, you will pee that out to start. It takes a little bit for your body to 
learn how to absorb that water and to actually use it. So maybe in the beginning with oral vitamin C or any botanical, or sorry, any supplement or botanical, you might not absorb the full amount, but as your body improves its state of health, you will absorb more and more. Um, so let's say orally, we can take vitamin C breakfast, lunch, dinner, and plus we'll take food. So we're of uh, vitamin C rich foods. So we're getting 200 plus food based at each meal. So 600 to 1000 milligrams per day of vitamin C. So how intravenous vitamin therapy or vitamin C therapy differs is I usually start people with a 5,000 milligram bag. So that's 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C going directly into your bloodstream. And similar to water, you may not use that right away You're, if it's new to your system. So you'll, you'll gradually, we always titrate someone up. We start them with a five gram vitamin C bag. Then on their next IV, we might go to a 10 gram vitamin C. Then we can go up to 20, 30, 40, 50. There are reasons why we may go higher, but typical wellness-based dosing would be five, 10 or 20 gram vitamin C bags. Um, so yeah, orally, if you take a thousand milligrams of supplement, vitamin C, 200 milligrams of that makes it to your bloodstream. With your first IV, you're getting 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C directly into your bloodstream. And then, you know, over time, maybe 10,000 milligrams or 20,000 milligrams. And there's something in terms of, um, uh, I wanted to say something, it'll come back to me. I'll just continue speaking freely about this. Um, oh yeah, if you took your vitamin C orally supplement wise and you had your IV, so then on you, you would have 5,000 plus 200 milligrams. So what we get orally is a little bit negligible to what we can get by IV, but you don't do IV every day. And it's really important that you start food-based first, then add in possible supplementation, especially in this season, and then consider intravenous vitamin therapy as that extra cellular repair, extra, um, now I remember what I wanted to say, um, extra fuel in our body. And so basically we know that vitamin C is important. It's a non-essential, sorry, it's an essential nutrient, meaning we have to get it orally. So we can't make it within our body like we do vitamin D. Um, so we really need vitamin C and okay, re re uh, recommended dairy, yeah, recommended daily allowance being 75 to 100 milligrams, that's very low. You're going to need it through food. But that's like, just that's the average. That's like to function. But we want to live our best. We want to achieve higher health. And so if every cell in our body uses vitamin C, then we, and, and we are limited by how much we can get orally. I love the IV because it brings that vitamin C into our bloodstream where our cells want more. We just, it, it's, it's hard to get it, get more through food alone. But um, for you know, many years, I've just believed people are, they may not have scurvy, but they're vitamin C deficient. So we're talking about optimal, we wanna optimize our cellular health, and vitamin C is really one of the key ingredients um, that we, we need and want in our bloodstream. And even, Lindsay, when you're talking about botanical medicine, vitamin C is a nutrient within plants, right? Like it helps, that, so, so you talked about soil, the, the health of the soil, we need vitamin C in there to help other things grow. So, um, and, and more so minerals as well in that soil, but um, it's just a foundational ingredient in our cellular health. Um, I was just thinking of something when you were speaking about food sources. Yeah. So there's kind of, a, you know, an overarching impression so, you know, you buy strawberries, kiwi fruits, oranges, peppers, they're really high in vitamin C. But again, the growing conditions that those vegetables and fruits right. went through, where they, you don't, you don't really know. So like, um, when they give a milligram dose of a food source of vitamin C, that's variable, depends on how the growing season was, if the plant was in health when it was harvested. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you, can, you can't, so I can't guarantee that food sources alone will be adequate to mm -hmm. provide what you need. Yeah, I love I love that analogy to what we talked about for plants. So same, what is the vitamin quality within our food that we're eating? And I'm sure people are asking, well, organic to non-organic, which has more? And it's not always the organic that has more micronutrients. So, but how do we really test our food? 
on a daily basis. Yeah. It's just not can. possible. <laughs> not possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think that's why juices have come into a greater appreciation because they're packing more micronutrients in a, in a condensed um, right. container. So really, well, higher immune health to me is more micronutrients in your system to help serve as building blocks for everything to work better. Yeah, to run the engine. I mean, hmm. your immune system is, it runs on micronutrients. Mm -hmm. Just have to go to like, that's well, well documented in the nutritional science. It's not like a myth and it's not a rumor. It's facts. Yeah. So yeah, and people I think need to be well educated and well informed about those facts. Yeah, exactly. And also um, just benefits of vitamin C, and this applies to many plants as well, um, they're antioxidant rich. So vitamin C is our, one of our main antioxidants, which means it's going to help us quench oxidants. And we're exposed to oxidants in everyday life. We can't hide from that. We can't prevent it, um, but we can help our body manage um, that oxidant um, intake. And so basically an oxidant is an unstable molecule and it wants to get stable. So when it comes into our body, so you're walking outside, a car is driving by, the gas from the car, that's an oxidant we're breathing in, and you can't, you can't prevent that. Um, antioxidants in our system, so vitamin C, and we have many antioxidants, will quench, help quench that oxidant before a cellular damage. So in order for that oxidant to get stable, it's going to take a molecule from a cell, or it can take a molecule that is served by an antioxidant. So we want the antioxidants in our system to quench those oxidants, to minimize cellular damage, and to reduce inflammation. And so vitamin C is an underappreciated nutrient, I feel. I mean, um, I can honestly say I didn't have a full appreciation of oral vitamin C until this period of time that we're going through right now. So I've always loved intravenous vitamin C. And I, I mean, I'm a foodie. I want people to get their micronutrients from food. But I didn't prescribe a lot of oral vitamin C. No. Not a lot. No, well, I would go to the IV, right? But right. now I'm fully, I would want everybody on oral vitamin C and periodic intravenous vitamin C. Yeah, I think that's a really stellar recommendation. It's such a simple and humble nutrient in yeah. what it does. It's yeah. very cost effective too. Um, I'm such and a vitamin C nerd now. I actually got <laughs> bumps when you said humble. <laughs> vitamin C is so humble, the humble nutrient. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, again, I think, well, I, the public has a pretty good understanding of um, that it's important, uh, but again, like just optimal dosing and the absorbability factors and how to deliver it in a more utilizable way, perhaps with IVP, definitely yeah. applicable. So we wanted to keep this to about 60 minutes, about an hour, and we know we've touched on some key points that we are passionate about in all of each of our respective practices and we want to continue this conversation. This was part one of our immune series so stay tuned for part two and part three. We will be posting this on our YouTube page and our community page and we welcome questions. Please share this webinar with your friends. It also teaches you or your friends more about each of us and how we collaborate together and uh, really um, I don't know, we, we're wishing everybody higher health and, and we need to stick together as a community through this time. And uh, Lindsay, do you have any additional words to say? You know I love ending off on Zoom recordings. <laughs> uh, no, I think you hit all the high points that, yeah, we, yeah, we're all in this together and we want to empower and educate and make sure people are um, taking care of themselves. Yeah. Absolutely. Empower and educate. Thank you everyone for listening to this. And uh, also, if you want to email us, the clinic email address is info at higherhealthcenter.com. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye, Lindsay. Have a great day. You too.